And uh, now um, let's welcome Xun and Adrian to talk about flow. Okay, great, let's get started. Um, hello everyone, we're here today to talk to you about Flow, Uber's If This Then That engine. I'm Adrian, I'm a front end engineer on the team. Today we're gonna talk to you about um, our, the problem space, our solution, inside the architecture, and discuss a few product teams that are using Flow. So what problems are we trying to solve? As you can imagine, events at Uber are at a massive scale. These can range from a user signing up to someone completing a trip, rating a trip, or a driver coming online or offline. At any point in time, there are thousands of event types taking place. At Uber, there are multiple services and platforms that process these events at a massive scale. However, we lacked the ability of a general purpose, if this, then that engine, to listen to events, evaluate a condition, and trigger an action. For example, find all drivers who signed up in Seattle, and then based off of the product type, either send the Uber X requirements or the Uber Black requirements. This may seem like a very simple workflow. All we're really doing here is sending out emails. But before Flow, this would have required someone to interact with three or four different services to complete this action. So the main components in this problem are users, events, conditions, and actions. Before we dive into the solution, I just wanna take a look at a few examples of each of these. A user could be a rider, driver, or restaurant. An event could be trip complete, in FIFO queue, or the time of day. Conditions could evaluate your trip count, what city you live in, or whether you're in a particular treatment group. And last, actions could be sending comps to a user, tagging a user's account, or even changing a driver's status. Now I want to introduce you to Flow. Our team started this journey a year and a half ago, and the engine we've built integrates tightly in Uber's ecosystem. Today we have 2,500 active workflows ser serving Uber's global markets. So what exactly is Flow? Flow is a generic platform for automating business process. Conceptually, like I've mentioned a few times, it's if this, then that. It provides easy access to create and manage workflows with just a few clicks. And best of all, it was built from the ground up to cater to Uber's scale. Today, we process 9 million events an hour with over 500,000 condition evaluations per second. Furthermore, we integrate with over 50 downstream services. Now I wanna take you through a real workflow. In this particular example, an operations team in Brazil wanted to know whether it was effective to send a rider an email promotion after they completed 100 trips. The first thing that you need to know about a workflow is the start node. A start node has preconditions and one of these must be an event because that is what um, triggers the condition evaluation. In this particular example, the event is trip complete in Brazil and we're also checking, as implied by the example, that the rider has 100 trips. The next part of a workflow is an edge. An edge, like the start node, has conditions. However, these do not need to be event-based. This particular edge, all we're checking is whether the, um, whether the rider lives in the particular city where we can offer this promotion. The last part of a workflow is a node. Nodes have actions and these actions are triggered immediately upon the user arriving at the node. There are a ton of different nodes um, in our system, so I'm just gonna highlight two. The first one is an experiment node which segments users into different groups for testing. And the second is an email node, which in this particular campaign, if the writer made it to this node, 
they would get the email with the, with the promotion. There are many other examples like this of teams across Uber using Flow to automate business process. For example, for onboarding, we send actionable information to drivers as it relates to required documents. For quality, there are workflows that inform drivers about low rating concerns and maybe some suggestions about what they can do to improve. There are workflows that um, outline incentives drivers can earn. Uh, ones that focus on city engagement, safety, and encouraging riders to take advantage of expiring promotions. Now I'm going to hand it off to Shun to explain inside Flow's architecture. Thanks, Adrian. So before diving into architecture, let's first take a look of the design requirement. So first requirement. Flow is event-driven, so it requires real-time processing. Secondly, it is low latency and high capacity, so it can handle thousands of workflows and millions of users in a timely manner. Reliability-wise, for event processing, it requires to give zero event loss. But on the other hand, for action execution, it's important to guarantee at most once uh, execution because it's better to have duplicates. For example, if we send the same email to the same user multiple times, that's a very bad user experience. Lastly, for state transition correctly, it's important to have transaction support. So with these requirements in mind, let's take a look of the design. So this is the architecture at a high level. At a high level, there are seven major components in the system. The first one is the event ingester. Event ingester will listen to Kafka. It uh, keep turning the Kafka data source, get the events, and then send it, to the, send it to the workflow execution engine for further processing. Second component is the workflow management. So workflow management enables developers and ops to create and manage the state machine style workflow. State management. As we know, each of the workflow in the system can have thousands or even millions of users. Each of the users in the workflow are represented as a workflow state. With the thousands of workflows in the system, Flow needs to manage almost billions of user states. All these states are stored in a scalable storage, Cassandra. Next one is the action module. The action module it, it provides a library of predefined actions and also a gateway to, to carry out action execution. Similarly, there's a condition module. It uh, provides a library of, of, of predefined uh, conditions and a gateway to carry out action, action and, no, sorry, carry out the condition evaluation. Analytics module. It collects billions of user execution history and use that for post analysis of user insights, workflow insights, and uh, workflow business impacts. The last one is a workflow execution engine. That's the most important uh, part of the system. It, you can consider it as the brain of the system. It will collect to all the other components, collect all the workflows, interpret the topology, evaluate the condition, update user states, and then trigger out actions. Now let's zoom into the workflow execution engine. It's actually a distributed layer with thousands of service worker deployed. So each of the service worker actually contain, contain two parts. One is the workflow starter. The other one is, is the workflow executor. For the starter, the responsibility is to, is to add a new user to the workflow. For the workflow executor, its responsibility is to update, update user state from one to another. So now, now let's take a look of the life cycle of, a, of an event. So when event was ingested into the workflow execution engine, it will first arrive a layer called Xiaomi. Xiaomi is a reliable queue. So it's very similar to Kafka, but it has two unique functionalities. First one, it's highly reliable. This is very important 
to guarantee zero event loss. Secondly, it has this uh, capability of supporting competing consumption model, which means when, when, the, when the server side talks to all the service worker, it will manage all the event processing status. It decides when to move on to the next event. And also, it, de it decides how to distribute all the events to the service workers. So with this kind of architecture, the service worker, the engineer implementation is, is relatively simple, and the system is very easy to scale out. Now, when the event reaches the service worker from Xiaomi server side, the service worker will do following things. First, it will extract out the user UID from the event. Then, it will use the user UID to check against the Cassandra user state layer. With that information, it will divide all the surface work, all the workflows into two big groups. One group, it will contain around uh, hundreds of workflows that a lot of them contain the user yet. The other group, it will be around 10 to 20 workflows. Um, each of them already have the user as a part of the workflow. So starter will take the first, uh, first group. It will evaluate each of the precondition. And if precondition pass, user will be added to the workflow. For the executor, it will take the second group. So it will based on user's current state, current state in the workflow. Find out all the outbound edge, evaluate the condition. If condition pass, move on to the next state, and also trigger out the action. Then it will do another round of evaluation based on the new state. It keeps doing this until it reaches a state that it has to wait for further event triggering. Once the service worker finishes all this, it will notify Xiaomi server side that uh, it finished the processing, it can move on to next event. If somehow the event processing failed, the Xiaomi server side will retry uh, a few times. If it still doesn't succeed, the event will move on to a data letter queue layer for further follow up. This is very important to ensure there's a low event loss without, a, without a loading. So this is basically how the system works. Now let's take a look of some of the challenges in the design and implement, implementation of this system. The first one I would like to talk about is to deal with the large fun out effect. So the problem here is when one event comes in, there are a whole bunch, actually there are like hundreds of workflows needs to be processed by the starter. Each of the workflow has multiple preconditions and each of the condition can have multiple subconditions. So based on the current event ingestion rate, the whole system needs to process almost uh, as high as 10 million per second of condition evaluation. So that's a huge load for the overall system and also to downstream surface. So how to solve this? We have multiple, we have multiple optimizations. So, for, so first we have multiple layer of filtering. So we know each of the workflow is waiting for some event. So we build this event to workflow mapping. With that, this effectively reduced the number of workflows needs to be processed by 80%. We also know in Uber, most of the workflows are managed by CD team. So this enables us to build a CD to workflow mapping that further reduced the number of workflows needs to be processed. Then when it comes to the stage of doing condition evaluation, we sort all the conditions by cost. So if a condition, for example, only use, only use information from the event and only doing very lightweight calculation, we consider it's very low cost. We will evaluate those conditions first. If low cost one doesn't pass, there's a low point to continue to ex expensive ones. We also have, um, we also add a lot of caching to reduce the downstream surface cost. We have cache at a Redis layer. We also have cache at a local machine. Uh, we also have cache at, uh, in the event context. For example, we have information, uh, we have data. Uh, after the evaluation, we store in the event context that will be carried over and reused during the whole evaluation, continued evaluation in the state machine graph. We also build in some smart handling for some of the conditions. For example, uh, we have a geofence condition. 
This one is very popular and used by a lot of the workflows. So if we blindly send the, all the geofence requests to the downstream survey, it's a huge amount. So we did some investigation and we find that for all the, all the polygons, all the geofence polygons used in the system is only a few thousand. So we decided to cache all those polygons at the local and integrate the geofence check library. That effectively reduced actually remove all the need of go, going to the downstream surface. So with all these optimizations, the system is very efficient. Uh, to give you some idea how efficient it is. So end of last year, we replaced a similar system using Flow. So that service used almost 6,000 Docker instance. Uh, but in Flow, we only use 300 and serving twice as much traffic. The last challenge uh, is, is uh, I will talk about scale out the state management using Cassandra. So using Cassandra, we met quite a lot of tricky issues and we solved them. Uh, I would like uh, to share a few lessons we learned. So the first one is to, is to avoid a hotspot. So by nature, some of the workflows are very popular. So that's not very good for Cassandra performance, especially we use the conditional update in our system. So we carefully choosing the, we carefully analyze the query pattern and uh, choosing the sharding schema. We shard the storage by user UID because at the user level, the event won't come in that, uh, that spiky. Second, uh, second lesson is to try to, um, I would recommend to separate the production and the analysis traffic. We used to have both served from same, same cluster that caused quite a lot, of, a lot of problems. So sometimes uh, expensive, a very expensive workflow and uh, uh, special analysis requirements, for example, to track the list of users on a load, that easily take away 95% of the, of the capacity. That's a lot of good for the rest of the system. Last one is we should try to avoid the deletion. We know in Cassandra, deletion is, uh, is, quite, a, is quite a bad. It causes tombstone, causes compaction, and causes latency spike. So if you have a whole bunch of data needs to be cleaned up from the system from time to time, try to use TTL to smooth out the compaction. Uh, there are also a lot of other challenges we met in the, in the design of this system. Uh, you're welcome to talk with us after the talk. Now I'm passing this back to Adrian to talk about uh, product teams using, using Flow. Okay, great. So uh, we thought it would be nice to ground um, the architecture and the product and discuss a few of the product teams that we've actually worked with um, and built some functional functionality out with Flow. So the first one I wanna to talk to you about is the airports team. Their problem was that drivers can wait a really long time at the airport to get a trip, but then it ends up only being a short trip. So it's not really worth it. To keep drivers happy, they decided to put drivers back in the front of the queue after they took a trip from the airport that was short. So in Flow, what they did was they built an event condition that could be used in a workflow to inform drivers when this happened that their spot was held for them. Leveraging the platform, they were able to build out an MVP for this in two days instead of building out an entirely new service. The next team I wanna to talk to you about is the driver education team. Their problem here is common for any app as complex as Uber. It's hard for new users to learn the app and it's hard to educate users about new features that are coming out. This was especially important for Uber given that we're launching a new driver app. What the team did was they built educational videos and in Flow, they, they built what they need, needed to be able to identify the users and send them the correct videos throughout their life cycle. The team was able to build this feature five times faster, which is awesome. And now we're currently helping to onboard about a million customers a month, if not more. 